If you're just getting started with electronics, then maybe you don't want to get a lab like this one just yet. So today I want to show you how you can set up your own electronics lab inside a tray. Now with this tray lab, you can follow along all the tutorials and projects on this channel. It has adjustable power supplies, voltmeter, ampermeter. It also has a PicKit 3 so you can program microcontrollers and it also has a tiny logic probe. And the best part, it doesn't cost a lot of money, it doesn't take up a lot of space and if you don't need it anymore, you can just tuck it away under your desk. So for the rest of this video, let's go through all the components that you need to set you up with your own electronics lab inside a tray. Hi, my name is Jens and I believe that everybody can learn electronics. And yes, it sounds a little bit ironic that I say everybody can learn electronics when I'm standing in front of a lab like this one. But hey, that's kind of the point of this entire video today. You don't need a lab like this to get started. So let's go and get you set up with your own electronics lab inside a tray. Well, first off, you need a tray. These under desk storage trays for the office are perfect because they are cheap, come in different sizes and they have all the necessary mounting hardware included. They also have built in compartments, which makes it very convenient for use with breadboards. I will use this one here and to make it a bit easier to film and take photos, I will not yet install this tray under my desk and wait until the end of this video to do that. But yes, I think it is so important that when you get started in electronics that you have your own safe space where you can do your experiments without interruption or interference. And that's why I think these tray labs are so amazing. They're not very big, but they also don't cost a lot of money and you can just tuck them away under your desk if you don't need them or pull them back out if you come home one evening and you have an extra 15 minutes. Now we also need power and in this tray lab we will use USB for that and that's kind of an easy choice because USB really is everywhere nowadays. It also has the advantage that we can just use that USB connection not just to deliver power but also to connect it to a laptop or a desktop computer if we want to work with microcontrollers and more on that in just a second. I recommend you to spend a little bit more and get a good USB hub that has at least four switchable USB outputs. This way you can easily switch components off and on without removing the cables, which is a huge plus in terms of convenience if you ask me. And if you want to be extra fancy, get one with an extra power supply input and this way your computer doesn't have to supply all the power to the hub. And all the other devices of our electronics lab will be USB based as well, so we can just plug them into the USB hub. This makes our system very easy to use, but also very flexible. Now, how do we get that sweet power onto our breadboard? That's actually two questions if you think about it. First, we need some sort of wire from the USB cable onto our breadboard. But USB always works with five volts, but maybe we need three volts or nine volts or 12 volts. For that reason, we also need some intermediate device that allows us to adjust the voltage from five volt to anything else. First off, if you really only want 5 volts and nothing else, you can get one of those USB breakout adapters here to directly access the plus 5 volt and ground connection straight from a USB cable. Ignore the S, D plus and D minus connections on the breakout adapter and just connect two wires at plus and minus and that will give you 5 volts and you can just plug those two wires straight into the breadboard. Or instead, you could use these USB breadboard power adapters here and they plug right into the breadboard. Most of these adapters have the advantage that they also give you the option to set them to 3.3 volts, which can be useful sometimes. Now for other voltages, we have to get more creative. In my lab behind me, I have this big bulky linear power supply and I love it. But if you're just getting started in electronics, this is probably way overkill and way more than you need. Instead, I recommend you to get one or more of these little USB powered power supplies. Yes, they are not the best power supplies in the universe, but they will definitely get you started. You can find them under many names with simple LED type displays, which I recommend for beginners, but there are also more advanced models out there. On the side, they come with a little knob that allows you to set the voltage between one volt and 24 volt, and they have a small connection terminal where you can access that voltage and connect it to your circuit. Now I prefer these mechanical versions with the knob to adjust the voltage. There are also other versions out there that have two push buttons, one to increase and one to decrease the voltage. And the problem with these modules is because they're a little bit cheap, when you reconnect the power, sometimes they forget the voltage that they were set to and that can be a big problem. And for that reason, I think sometimes simpler is just better and I recommend the mechanical ones with the knob. A lot of the videos on my channel use PIC microcontrollers and if you wanna use them too, then you need a programming adapter. I have a 
detailed video on how to set up the PicKit 3 and you can find that video right here and go check that out later if you want. The PicKit 3 is no longer sold by Microchip because it has been discontinued and if you want you can spend a bit more to get their new PicKit 4 but the unofficial PicKit 3 versions you can find on eBay, Amazon and other websites usually work well in my experience and here you can see the original and the clone side by side. Now in my lab I have a precision benchtop multimeter that you can see behind me right there that measures voltage, current, resistance, capacitance and a bunch of other stuff. But especially as a beginner you can imagine that these things can be a little bit expensive sometimes. Fortunately for us there are very small USB powered volt and ampere meters that measure the voltage and the current that passes through them. Granted, the voltage display is not all that useful because it will always be close to 5 volts because that's the voltage for USB, but measuring the total current can be quite handy. I also recommend to get one of these logic probes here. Especially with microcontrollers, these can be a true lifesaver because it's so easy with them to see if there is activity on microcontroller pins or if the circuit is dead. These probes have two connections, VDD and ground. So when using them, you need to make sure that they are plugged into the power rail of the breadboard circuit that you are trying to troubleshoot. So now the time has come, let's put it all together. Of course the exact placement depends on the kind of components that you have, on the space that you have available. So here I'll just show you what I came up with. First I placed the USB hub in the top left corner and I used some velcro strips to mount it in place. This way it'll be easy enough to move it around if I ever change my mind. We also need a collection of USB cables and I used these coiled ones here because they don't take up so much space and I kind of like the way that they look. Because most of my circuits use PIC microcontrollers, I first placed the PIC kit 3 right in the middle of the tray. But because it's all kept in place with velcro strips, I could also move it around if I ever needed to. And for the USB breakout adapter, I first added the USB volt and ampere meter in series and then decided to place it in the middle here, right below the PIC kit 3. Next are the adjustable USB power supply modules and I got two of them just in case because you never know. I again used some velcro strips to place them on the right side inside the upper compartment of the tray. And then we can connect it all together with the USB cables. Now these middle compartments here are still a bit empty but like we saw before the dimensions work out perfectly for large, medium and small breadboards. The breadboards are the only thing I don't want to fix in place with velcro because I end up moving them around too much. And then you can store the logic probe or any other small tools in this front compartment here so that you have it all in one place. So there you have it, your own electronics lab inside a tray. The overall cost of these components should be in the neighborhood of $150, which I think is a great deal to get started in electronics. Now what we haven't talked about yet are the components that you need for each and every single project, you know, like resistors, capacitors, integrated circuits, microcontrollers, that sort of thing. Now all my tutorials and projects come with a detailed companion article where you can always find links where exactly you can buy these components, so I hope that's not too difficult for you to find them. But okay, I also want to really show you that this works and you can totally build the projects on this channel with this tray lab. So let's go through a couple of examples. Here is an example where we drive the WS2812 NeoPixel LEDs from within our tray lab. We can program the microcontroller with the included PicKit 3 and if we add more LEDs to the circuit, the total current consumption goes up as expected. And we can of course turn the entire circuit on and off with the press of a single button. As another example, this is the circuit from the Max7219 LED multiplexing tutorial. It uses an 8x32 LED dot matrix display and as you can see, the dot matrix display really consumes some power. If we change the LED brightness level with this push button here, we can look at our ampere meter to see that the current really decreases to smaller values. And as a last example, here is the breadboard from our DS1302 real-time clock tutorial. Maybe you remember that we had some problems to get a high enough LED brightness because they were quite dim at 5V. Now that we have additional power supplies, we can use one of these to supply a dedicated LED voltage at 6V, 7V, basically anything we want. And yes, as you can see, the LED brightness really goes up. So what are you waiting for? I hope I could show you today that it's not that hard to get set up with a small electronics lab and I really hope I could inspire you to give it a try yourself because yes, everybody can learn electronics and that means that you can learn electronics too. And if you do, please share it with me either here in the comments or on social media. I always love seeing your creations. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what else you want to learn and I'll see you next time.